Hi, my name is Matt Gordon, and welcome to my DPS 2020 presentation on crushing a cloud migration. Let's get right into it here. So, as this says, I am director of database management for a company called Rev.io. Uh, they're located in Atlanta, Georgia, in the US. Uh, I was actually fortunate enough to speak in person at DPS last year, um, one of the most awesome conference experiences of my life. So really happy that I'm a part of it this year, really happy that you're here as well. A little bit more about me, and these are basically all of the different ways to find me. So obviously I hope that we can interact uh, via the chat, Q&A, all, all the ways we can do it across these few days. Um, but if you want to contact me outside the conference or something like that, here's my email. Twitter, blog, and you'll notice SQL at speed is kind of a theme. Through all of those, that's the uh, that's the best way to find me online. Um, not a lot of interesting stuff here, but I do want to point out that uh, I've been scoping and executing migrations, both as a consultant and as not, for se several years. Um, so this isn't uh, something where I've just kind of read a bunch of web pages like, well, I think we're supposed to migrate it this way and put together these slides. Um, I've built them from real real world experience, uh, both good and bad, for sure. Uh, the other thing I wanted to point out is that I run the Lexington, Kentucky Pass Group. I know this is not a pass event, um, but I'm really happy that people are at any community event at all. Obviously, this year has been profoundly challenging for so many. Um, like I said, very happy that you're here, very happy that I'm here, very happy that we're all a part of this, whether it's data platform geeks or pass or what have you, uh, getting involved in your local data community. Um, th the worst case is you're going to learn some stuff. The best case is you're going to make some great friends. You're going to learn some things. You may improve your job, all those sorts of things. So thanks for being here. Thanks for listening to me. Uh, so as I said, I'm SQL at Speed Online. Really just a good excuse to show this slide. Um, if you're a fan of motor racing, it's the only thing I like to talk about more than data stuff. So uh, happy to chat about that. But anyway, let's dive into it. We're not here to learn about me. We're here to learn about how we're going to migrate SQL Server data to the cloud. So before we dive into this, uh, the one point that I do want to make is that you're going to see me talk about Azure a lot. And that's not to minimize Amazon, not to minimize the offerings that Google Cloud has as well. But having spent several years as a consultant, it's my contention that um, Azure, just because of the Azure hybrid benefit and some of the pricing advantages that Microsoft can bring to the table because they own all of it, um, I, I really think Azure probably is the best cloud. So that's where we're going to focus um, most of most of this conversation here. If you want to see a good deep dive into um, kind of a, a full hour long comparison of migrating to Amazon versus Azure, pros and cons by somebody who's done it, uh, my friend Corey Hambrick, who is Hambone DBA on Twitter. Um, he does an hour presentation that happened at SQL Saturday, Cincinnati, and at least a couple other events this year. And it's an excellent presentation. If, and if you're not able to find a recording of that or something, uh, please reach out to me and, and I'll make sure I plug that in with you. Um, Cause really Corey does a great job of spending an hour diving into what may be better for you. And we're gonna focus mostly on, on Azure here, but some of what we're talking about does translate into Amazon as well. So why are we migrating databases? We're gonna spend a, a good chunk of this session talking tech and the tooling involved and what are some advantages of certain tools, disadvantages, all those sorts of things. But I wanna set kind of the non-technical foundation up front because that's what's really important here. And first things first, we have to understand why we're migrating stuff, right? So what are our motivating factors here? So let's look at a few, and these are some of the most popular ones. And like I said, through all the different ways we have to interact in this presentation, uh, definitely reach out and see if you feel like maybe I've left one or two or three or four out, um, or if you feel like this is a pretty decent list. Um, and along those lines, uh, though I really welcome and encourage direct feedback here, uh, all the different ways that the conference itself gives you to provide feedback to the speakers, please take advantage of those. Uh, we do read it. We do 
take it to heart. Even if you think it was really, really bad, uh, please, you know, at least send me why you think it was. Like, well, that was the worst talk I saw the entire time. Uh, but here's some constructive feedback on, on how I think it might be better for me. And if you think it was amazing, go ahead and tweet that out. <laughs> Anyhow, so uh, our motivation for migrating databases. The one I hear most often as a consultant was saving money. And that's possible, right? All the cloud providers have done a really good job saying, well, if you move to the cloud, your database will never go down. You're going to save all this money. You're going to have all this extra time and, and stuff, and, it, and, and it's going to be amazing. My argument is that that depends on what you choose. And, and we'll get into terminology a little later when we start to talk about some of the tools and things like that. But IaaS stands for infrastructure as a service, and that's what we would know as migrating to a VM on somebody's cloud. PaaS stands for platform as a service. And that's where we're talking about kind of database as a service. Like we're not managing a server. There may be a logical server involved like there is with Azure SQL, but we're not managing any of the bare metal or anything like that. We're just putting a database on a database server somewhere. So the cost savings is important when you kind of balance those two in it. And I'll hit this point again later as well. In my opinion, and when you go and look at the pricing calculator, you can bear this out depending on the nature of what you're moving. Often, I think the real cost savings come from the platform as a service offering, but there are some technical restrictions there, though they're a lot less than there were. Uh, so that may not be the right option for you, depending on the age of your app, depending on um, some of what may or may not be in code. And like I said, we'll, we'll dive into the details of this a little more, but I did want to touch on this up front because I would hear it as a consultant all the time. Like, well, we're going to bring you in and we're going to do a SQL Server migration and we're going to save a bunch of money because the salesperson told us that we were going to. Not necessarily. And especially if you're going to IaaS and you're not maybe consolidating a, lo a lot of databases on one VM, it could potentially be more expensive than the data center that you're in now. So cloud doesn't equal automatic money savings. It really depends on the migration target and those sorts of things. And we'll get more into that later, but I did want to touch on that up, up front. Another motivation, and I've heard this a lot too, is we have a data center and we want to go ahead and shut that down. There's only a few racks left there and we have a project this year to move all those servers, move all their data to the cloud somewhere, and we're going to shut the entire data center down. Or we're going to decommission a server room or something like that perfectly valid point that then can be a different motivation like i had a client once upon a time a financial services firm in new york city they were maintaining a data center in manhattan very expensive money was no object to them because moving anywhere in the cloud in any way costs less and so from that perspective, trying to save a few dollars here or there and maybe pick a PaaS offering when we would have preferred to be on a VM didn't make any sense at all. They just wanted up into the cloud as fast as possible. So that's something to think about there. Um, you know, we, I, I think a lot of us, especially in the economic climate we're in, we're kind of attuned to why I need to save money for the company where I can. And that may be perfectly valid. It probably is. But for every company, it's not. The last motivation I wanted to hit on this slide is one I do get sometimes, more often at conferences, but my boss told me I had to do it. That, you know, it's a personal goal. It's, I have a bonus writing on it. I have, um, you know, I have a promotion writing on it, something like that. Uh, perfectly legitimate motivation, but again, we're going to maybe take some different things into account. Maybe it's not a project. Maybe we just had to demonstrate that we know how to migrate something in, into Azure and that ticks that box and, and then we get our bonus check or something like that. So your aims there are going to be different. You're going to be focused on probably migrating it up there as quickly and as easily as possible. And I'll, and I'll show you some things later in, in the demo section about you know, some ways we can do that. So these are all perfectly valid. Let's hit a couple more. So this is, I don't encourage this and that's the reason I've kind of buried it on this slide. Um, but I have had customers where this mattered a lot. So as we know, in the summer of 2019, SQL Server 2008, uh, and I believe corresponding Windows Server 2008 as well, went out of support at roughly the same time. 
I still encounter clients with large implementations of SQL Server 2008 for a variety of reasons, legacy apps, all those sorts of things. I do not encourage you staying on that version. However, having dealt with some care, some clients in the healthcare realm and things like that, I understand that risk management people get involved, executives get involved, and sometimes the technical decision that we know is best for us is not appropriate or not even allowed. Um, and so if you find yourself in a position where you're managing a lot of SQL Server 2008 servers and they're out of support and that scares you, and it should, if you migrate those to Azure, Microsoft has some extended support benefits that come with that. And so that's something to think about. Like I said, I don't encourage it, but if you're in that boat and you just can't get off 2008 in time, then migrating those to Azure will kick on some extended support for you that you wouldn't otherwise have. And I, I should have a link on the resources slide at, at, at the end that would go into more detail there if that's interesting to you. And if not, just feel free to hit me up offline or in our chat window here and ask me. The last motivation, and I see this more and more, and it kind of dovetails with the last bullet on the previous slide, is, well, I have a bonus goal writing on it, or we have a team goal, and we need to get some stuff migrated. I don't really understand a lot of the cloud stuff. I don't know how it's put together. So I just want to lift and shift what we have on-prem up into the cloud. And I don't, I don't want it to be different. I don't want it to look different. It just It'll live somewhere else, right? And the cloud, as the saying goes, is just someone else's computer in somebody else's data center. Lifting and shifting isn't always the right choice technology-wise. You're going to hear me make this point a few times through this because I really want that to be one of the takeaways from this. Um, I've gone into clients where they'll say, we have you know 20 four-node always-on availability groups, and we want those 80 servers with the same architecture up in Azure. That's going to be expensive. And always-on availability groups, setting them up in Azure, there's even more moving parts in Azure, for one, than there is on prem so you really have to stop and think and i'll underscore this point over and over is that architecture and just lifting and shifting that is that the right choice for you odds are it's not and you know it seems like though i would say the marketing around the azure sql is picked up and, and they're doing a better job kind of cluing people in on what the architectures are and how you're best served by them a lot of or some of the Azure SQL database service tiers are essentially always on availability groups underneath them. And we'll talk more about that. So if you have these complicated high availability architectures and you're like, well, we've spent so much time and money on this. We just want to move it to, to the cloud. You can get there uh, and you can probably get there without the management overhead that you have now and do that through Azure SQL. And we'll do that when we talk more about the different service tiers and kind of what an appropriate migration target might be for you. But as we walk through the rest of this, keep that in mind, that just lifting and shifting what we have may not make sense. So now we've talked about why. And a lot of times that's exciting, right? We're going to kick off a project, whether a consultant's come in to help us, whether it's an internal project, whatever. You've got something new and fun to do, maybe something you haven't done before. So that's cool. You're excited. You're looking forward to uh, coming to work each day. And then you get to this. Somebody has stood in your way. And there's a couple different perspectives to take on this. And, and you know, not knowing exactly who, who would attend this session, um, I've kind of put a couple different paths in here. Um, if it's an internal project where it's all internal employees, uh, some different considerations than if there are consultants out in, in the crowd, like I was. And you have to worry about some different things that probably internal employees for an internal project don't. So let's jump into some of those here. So what is standing in our way? Uh, management support can be the number one. So even though on that last slide, I've said that sometimes the motivation or, or who kind of set us on this path is manager says, you're getting a promotion, you're getting a raise, you're getting whatever, as long as this is done in the next several months. Sometimes you won't. And sometimes that, you know, we know because we've come to conferences like this, we've attended SQL Saturdays, we talk to people online. We know that maybe some flavor of Azure SQL or Amazon RDS or whatever, is right for us and right for the databases that we're supporting. And we go to our manager and they, you know, maybe have a very old school or traditional attitude. And they're like, I, you know, I don't know a lot about this cloud stuff. I haven't been hands on with the tech in a few years. I don't trust it. We're not going to do it. That happens. 
Uh, and that's something we have to kind of learn to work around. And when we get to the end of this slide, I'll, I'll give a couple ideas that I have for that. But let's talk about some other obstacles here too. So maybe the operations team is reluctant to do this. And that's important because, and I'll mention this later as well, um, when we're moving to Azure, if there is no corporate Azure footprint, if kind of that networking groundwork is not already laid, network security groundwork laid, all those sorts of things, we really need to rely on whether it would be called general IT or operations or whatever that team or person is called where you are. Their reluctance to do this can be a real obstacle for us because we do need them to help. And that's where, you know, that we talked about management support potentially being an obstacle. Um, if you have executive or management buy-in, that's what kind of frees some of this up. Um, so though, you know, management support is one thing. Maybe we have one manager telling us that it's good and the person above them is telling us that it's not. Maybe we're running into that with the operations team as well. And finally on this slide, maybe the dev team is resistant to change and they're, you know, maybe this move means that instead of, uh, for whatever reason, managing their own development database servers, um, they, uh, you know, they're, they're not, uh, and they're going to end up on Azure SQL and the management then turns over to the DBA team, where in my opinion, it should be. Maybe they don't like that. The way to kind of resolve all of this and not to delve too deeply into like organizational politics and things like that, but that's going to be a theme on, on a couple of these slides is understand who can make things happen for us in our organization. You know, best case it's you or it's your direct boss who can go to all these people and say, we're migrating, we're doing it inside the six months and you're going to work along with us. And he can pull those teams together, he or she. If not, then find the people in the organization that can make that happen. And sometimes it's people with official titles and all those sorts of things. Sometimes it's not. Sometimes it's maybe you've got an Azure architect that's that's a strong, uh, has a strong knowledge base, strong personality. Everybody kind of responds to them. And maybe none of these people work for that person, but they're going to do what that person says because they respect their knowledge, their vision, all those sorts of things. So Keep your eyes open uh, and, and see if there are people in the organization by by t by official title or not that, that can help you move these mountains, because sometimes they very much are that. Um, so let's talk about some other things. Who else might be standing in, in our way here? Security groups <clears throat> that often, I, I would say this is going away, but you still see it quite a bit, where they express reservations on, uh, well, you know, four years ago for me, Azure, Amazon were insecure. They didn't carry this type of certification and we're in healthcare. So, you know, their data centers um, haven't passed this type of audit or whatever. And I think years ago, that was a legitimate concern. But I have a link to a page on the resources slide at, at the end that, in my opinion, is kind of the best response to something like this. Because uh, even as a consultant, I would still hear this. Well, Azure's insecure. I read an article in an online magazine that said it didn't have this, this, and that, and that we shouldn't put financial data in it, or shouldn't put healthcare data in it. Uh, the page that I linked to on my resources slide kind of answers all that. And so it talks about all the different security certifications and compliance certifications that Azure data centers hold. Amazon, I'm sure, has, has an equivalent page as well. So while this used to be a valid argument, and you should certainly entertain this, and you know, generally security people have a, have a veto, so you don't just kind of want to yell at them and tell them they don't know what they're doing, but you want to respond to them with real information. And that's why I've put that link on on the slide um, that page has never has never failed me in terms of sending it to a security person and basically saying here's the list of certifications that these carry do you find those sufficient and you know 10 times out of 10 they have networking team going back to what i mentioned a couple minutes ago uh, if the networking team doesn't have a strong uh, azure knowledge base strong azure architect that's okay. That's something to be acknowledged. This probably isn't one that we can work directly to overcome. This is something where we would need management or a boss or something like that to maybe bring in an outside 
consultant to help upskill our networking team that maybe would be weak in this area. Um, I think for something like this, that's definitely what I would recommend. The networking bits of Azure, the authentication bits of Azure, uh, which we won't really get into too deeply here because it's, it's really kind of outside our scope, but it's important when you're thinking about an overall migration project. And you know, if you don't have that strong Azure person in-house, then I would recommend bringing some somebody in because the database stuff is going to be tricky uh, slash impossible until we have the network set up right, we have the security group set up right, we have authentication federated, all those sorts of things. So don't minimize the networking uh, team concern and whether that falls in networking or operations or where you are is kind of both. Um, like I said, that's definitely where I'd recommend bringing in somebody outside. Last but not least, and I've run into this as well, maybe the DBA team, maybe you're all excited and you're the team lead and your manager's all excited and they're pushing you to do this. And there are team members that are stalling on this because they're uncomfortable with the cloud. They, you know, maybe they poked around Azure SQL five years ago, found, found it lacking, which arguably it, it was. And maybe they, um, you know, they don't want they don't want to do this. And so anything that they're asked to do, whether you're in a position of authority or not, they're going to kind of slow walk that. Um, and, and it's not malicious usually. I think, you know, most data professionals at this point realize that, that um, cloud data, it's going to be part of our life for a very long time. And so I, I, I can only think of one person that I've run into in the last three years that still thinks this is a fad. But you need to be respectful of the challenges they feel. And maybe it's something as simple as they don't feel like their skills are upgraded to the point where they can operate in a, in a cloud-based environment. And that's okay. The great thing about now is that there are tons of resources to get you there. Um, you know, there's certainly paid resources out there, Pluralsight, LinkedIn Learning, things like that. Uh, but for something, for a specific topic like this, you know, hey, I want to learn how to migrate stuff to the cloud. And I want to learn the basics of what I do when it gets there. Uh, Microsoft put together a series of workshops kind of around the launch of SQL Server 2019 last year, but but they still apply very well now, is they said, they called it From Ground to Cloud. And the list of those workshops and labs and all that is also linked off my resources slide as well. If you're fortunate enough where you can obtain some paid training, whether it's sending people to conferences or specific classes or something like that, generally that's always good. But if you don't have the budget for that and you still need to get their skills up, then something like the ground to cloud workshops is perfect. Um, something like the some of the stuff we're going to walk through later here works very well as well. So all of that, uh, you know, it can kind of come together. We can get everybody working on on the same page with this. And I think, you know, of five of the six obstacles that I've just talked about, uh, we can move those mountains ourselves with some of the tips that we've just talked about. Um, it, with the exception being, like I said, that kind of network and authentication architecture. Uh, if you don't have that ex expertise in house, you should definitely go find it. There's a lot of people that are really good at that. And your migration journey is going to be so much more pleasant and happy <laughs> if you have that foundation laid properly. So I mentioned that executing as an outside consultant is different than if we're an internal resource. And I've been on both sides of this. So much like where I said politics is going to kind of interweave itself here, having that keen sense of organizational politics if you're coming in from outside and trying to execute a migration you've got to understand who has what title and then who has what respect and position within the organization as well it's not always going to be the same thing there may be somebody who it says they're vice president of data operations but they don't have the respect of the people underneath them and like I said, maybe there's that cloud architect or that DBA team lead or something like that who's really calling the shots, who everybody, that's that's who they work for. And that's who they respond to, even though the organization chart may, may say something else. Um, so this is really important, especially as you start to fold in, you know, and this is kind of outside our scope here because we're just talking about migrating the data. But um, 
a lot of times as we migrate data, then the app teams are going to say, well, you're migrating the databases that support my applications. I'd like my applications to go into Azure as well. And that needs to be part of the project scope. You know, again, not really what we're talking about here, but very likely to happen. And that's where that strong understanding of, of the org chart and things like that, really important. Understand the competing interests at play. Understand who wants to migrate and why. Understand who doesn't and why. And kind of try to balance those. And as an outside consultant, a lot of time you own this. Uh, maybe it's just you. Maybe it's a team, but you're leading the team. Uh, but you you own this process. You have to you have to get it done, right? Because generally you, your company or you don't get paid until it's done. So understand who whose motivations are what, and then try to use that to your advantage to get this done as efficiently as possible. And last but not least, learn where the centers of power are. Like I said, it's different for every place. In some places, the DBA team, very strong, and people kind of get out of their way and do what they say. In other places, it might be networking. It might be operations. It might be IT. Uh, it might be a single person, like we've talked about. All of that's possible. And so just be cognizant of that and, and you know make notes if you have to, but understand that sometimes on paper, the person whose permission you ask um, isn't the person whose permission you actually need. So maybe you cover your bases and, and ask the person who's actually in charge and the person who says they're in charge. If you're a full-time employee and this is an internal project, potentially politics are less of a concern for you. You've worked there a while. You you have stronger relationships with everybody. You're not trying to build those on the fly and execute a project. But maybe that's not the case. You know, maybe your company's grown by acquisition and you're working with a bunch of teams and people you don't really know that that well. Very possible. Um, that's where, and, and I, my phrasing is probably a bit awkward here, but that's where you know you can probably work up the org chart for support to move obstacles. You know, when I mentioned a couple slides ago that maybe you know maybe you need to go high enough up where it's not your team lead that can get the operations team to do the networking thing for azure that you need them to but it's it's the team leads manager um, understanding that org chart and understanding kind of who has the real power and who other teams are responsive to as well because we're going to need other teams to make this successful um, knowing that org chart and maybe it's not politics but it's just knowing where you work and knowing who's in control and who's not that's important here. And last but not least, if you have the option, depending on, on the size of your org and how you're set up and all that, embedding yourself as a part of these meetings and as a part of this project can be very helpful. Having some knowledge of Azure networking and federating active directory authentication to Azure and all those sorts of things. Maybe it's outside your normal scope of work, but being in these meetings, having a say, being in in the room where it happened, um, that can really be helpful and something you shouldn't shy shy away from. You know, as 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 data moves more and more into the cloud and all those sorts of things, it's really less and less convenient for DBAs to just kind of sit on on our own and say, well, you know, we don't have to deal with you. We just deal with data because now the data is the networking people and the operations people and all that. They're all part of what we do. So don't shy away from staying involved in this and, and learning lots of stuff. So where are we migrating? This is important, obviously. We need to understand what our migration targets are and what the pros and cons of those are. And, and we'll go through those uh, pretty quickly here. So like I said, I wanted to define this term again. We talked about it briefly earlier, but I want to throw the diagram in here because infrastructure as a service doesn't really roll off the tongue. IaaS does. And as you can see from the chart here, everything blew and up. We're managing the operating system all the way through the app. So no worry about the bare metal. Um, you know, we know the resources that that have been provisioned for us, but we're not we're not doing anything with those other than running applications against them. So IaaS is when we talk about VMs, we're talking about IaaS, and you'll hear people kind of use those terms interchangeably. And um, Platform as a service, or PaaS, is Azure SQL Database, Azure SQL Database Managed Instance, those sorts of things. So those are kind of the two um, contrasting target realms, and then there are some specific service tiers within a couple of those as well. So we'll dive right into those. So 
SQL Server on IaaS VM. Basically what this means is you provision an Azure VM and you install SQL Server on it. Although there are also, uh, if you're not familiar with provisioning VMs, if you go to the Azure portal, which we'll have a look at later, and say you want to create a SQL Server virtual machine, there are a lot of images you can choose from that basically take care of the installation for you. And so if you're just trying to learn, that can be a great way to go. Um, just install, there's a developer edition image, SQL Server 2019 on top of Windows Server 2019. Um, you know, it being dev edition, the SQL Server license is free, though limited in what you can use it for. Uh, the Windows Server license, pretty modest cost, can be a great playground to kind of understand this stuff if, if you're new to VMs in Azure. A um, couple different ways you can do this here. So there is something called Azure Migrate that if you have that Azure or Cloud Architect person or team, they're going to be familiar with this. Um, it's a way to lift and shift physical machines or on-premises VMs up into Azure. I would argue this isn't necessarily recommended for databases. I would prefer not to see that happen like that. Um, but if you're, if you're very, very new to this, it is arguably an option. You just go to your ops team and say, use Azure Migrate and put the server up up here and they can work with you to do that. Um, not recommended for the future, but maybe kind of that first baby step, that's okay. As I mentioned earlier, think about whether lift and shift is the right strategy for you, um, especially if you have complicated uh, high availability architectures. It may not be the right strategy for you. Um, you may end up costing yourself a bunch of money and maybe you've gone and you've justified this to your boss that, hey, we're going to save a bunch of money and then it turns out you haven't. That can be a really difficult and awkward conversation to have. We don't want to do that. Last but not least, if, if our migration target is this, what's the reason? Did we choose it for a technical reason that maybe none of the Azure SQL database flavors are quite right and they don't support our legacy code? and our legacy databases and all those sorts of things. Or do we choose it for comfort? And I've definitely seen that and that's okay. But I, I've worked with customers where they were honest. So, well, we migrated all of this to VMs because VMs is what we know. I can RDP into it. I have management studio. It's the same thing I've been do, you know, doing for 15 years. This is okay. And this is what I want to do, but it's probably not the best technical decision and not the best decision, not only to keep your data state current, but to keep the skills of your team current as well. So, okay, so let's get into Azure SQL database. So again, this is, this is a PaaS offering. So platform as a service, and I'm gonna try to be tricky with the terminology here. Like I said, uh, Microsoft is getting uh, much better on the marketing on this. Um, like there's there's a YouTube series called Data Exposed that's been a lot of deep dives in the Azure SQL stuff, a um, lot of introductory stuff. I've got a couple videos on it. It's all out on YouTube if you look up Data Exposed, where they're going into all this and explaining terminology and all that. But part of it is the marketing terminology around this is shifting. And this slide specifically is, is one area where that's happened. So for a bit, they were referring to Azure SQL Database single as kind of the traditional deployment model that we know, where it's like, I've created a logical server, I've created a database there, and that's single. They don't really call that anymore. I've left it on the slide because for me, I think it's helpful to contrast it with Elastic Pool. Uh, but that's just something I, I wanted to point out there. So single is isolated by logical server. Uh, and, and you'll understand that when you go to create your first one, if you just go to the Azure portal and you go to SQL databases, when you go to create it, it's going to ask you if you want to create a logical server or use one you already have. And you can have multiple databases on that server and you kind of know that server by name. But you're not necessarily managing the resources there. It's, it's a logical boundary. Elastic pool is is different. So it's a collection of these with a shared and gated set of resources. So there's CPU, memory, and all those sorts of things that's shared among the pool. Um, but then it's kind of a hard cap on top of that pool. Of course, anytime you're in it, you're in Azure SQL and you're talking about a hard cap, we can obviously scale. We can move back and forth between most of the service tiers. Uh, so that hard cap is a bit of a misnomer. But 
these elastic pools basically databases that are built to kind of um, live together, potentially fail over together, all those sorts of things. Uh, and in a more advanced kind of Azure SQL database session, we would talk about some of that. But we're just talking about migration targets and what our options are here. Now, another part of the shifting marketing is manage instance you know, now is officially called Azure SQL Database Managed Instance. Arguably, it, it always was, but you've seen that shift uh, in more of the official marketing stuff and all that. So I've left it here, but we're going to skip it for now because I actually want to uh, I want to deal with that later because I want to go into Azure SQL Database because odds are, if we're picking a platform as a service offering, that's where we're going to be, and you know, hopefully. Uh, hopefully that is an option for you because like i said i think this is where the real cost savings comes in this is where the really exciting part of migration projects is for me so let's have a look at so what are the details of azure sql the t sql support is nearly equivalent to on-prem sql server so one thing you'll get hearkening back to the slide where we talked about management saying oh you know it doesn't support this and when i looked three years ago i couldn't run this kind of command on it. And so that used to be true. They've done a tremendous amount of work uh, changing that surface area. So yeah, it does not support cross database queries. That's true. So if you have legacy database, legacy applications, and it's, you know, maybe you've got a bunch of databases in an instance and you have a security database and an application database and all that. And the stored procedures say security.dbo.login user, blah, blah, blah. Uh, you can't do that. And there are some tricky workarounds with elastic jobs and things like that. But long story short, you're going to have to change code to use Azure SQL Database, the, the non-managed instance flavor. There's also no SQL Server agent. Now, there, there are elastic jobs uh, which are available in the portal now, not GA yet, but you know, obviously they'll get to that point. But that's going to be a change. If you have agent jobs, you're not going to directly migrate those elastic jobs. They're certainly different. Um, so that's kind of the basics. Those are the cons. What are some of the pros? So what we've got here is, um, and I'll talk about this a little more on, on the next slide. Azure SQL Database has two licensing models. You have the DTU model, which is kind of older and more traditional. Like if you've been in Azure SQL a while, you're familiar with that. And then V cores, which are more recent. And on the next slide, we'll talk a little bit more about those. But the different service tiers break down a different way there. So, you know, you've got your basic standard and general purpose service tiers. Um, they separate compute and storage. So the performance a little lesser than some of the other tiers. But you get an SLA to four nines, which for most of your data centers, um, you know, you may or may not even be there. So that's nice. And basic is very cheap. Basic is four ninety nine a month. Arguably not for production workloads, but I've run productionist things against those with some success. So don't throw basic out as not an option, but it would have to be a, a fairly small app and not a lot of data. Uh, service tiers like premium and business critical co-locate compute and storage. And so you're going to get more performance there. And the higher tiers here you're going to see that those are basically always on availability groups under the covers. So going back, you know, where I had a customer tell me like, I've got all these four node AGs and I'm going to migrate them to Azure and I want to create 80, 80 VMs and 20 always on AGs over again. Uh, maybe going to business critical or something like, like that would be right for you because mechanically under the covers, and you can see this in, in the docs, it's basically an always on available availability group without a cluster that you have to manage. And so you get all, all the benefits of that architecture, which part of the reason you chose it on-prem, you don't have to do the management. And we're talking platform as a service here as well. So patching and all that stuff is taken care of for us here. So I mentioned the purchasing models on, on the last slide. And here they are. Um, so we have the DTU based model. I have links to the Microsoft docs here. Uh, DTU based is not valid for managed instance that, that goes by vCores and resources. So this is purely Azure SQL database, non MI, uh, but that, what is a DTU link there? I wanted to make sure that was here and available to you in the slides. Um, Andy Mallon, he's at AMTWO on Twitter. Uh, he is a DBA 
and MVP here out of Boston, Massachusetts, uh, wrote the best non-Microsoft description I have ever read of what a DTU is. So if you're interested in that and knowing how they calculate that and what that means for your performance and things like that, check out Andy's article. It's fantastic. Otherwise, we have you know, the basic docs here um, and kind of what Microsoft says it is as well. But a Andy's article is awesome. So we haven't covered capacity caps and things like that here, but broadly stated, if your database is larger than four terabytes, you're going to run into, without a lot of tricky work, um, the Azure SQL database non-MI cap of four terabytes. That's as big as they can get. That may be restrictive for you. If you're in a large org, databases are large. And you know, before a year or two ago, you were just kind of stuck. Um, you were going to have to rethink your architecture and then what needed to be in, in the cloud. Now we have something called Azure SQL Database Hyperscale, which is really cool. And I have a slide briefly at the end that goes into the storage architecture. I'm really excited about this because I know at Pass Summit they introduced, um, I think, a hyperscale tier of their Postgres platform as a, as a service offering. I feel like you're going to see this architecture more and more throughout Azure SQL. And it really just throws the doors open in terms of awesome performance and, and makes backups and restores so much easier. So I'm, I, I'm excited about the nerdy stuff under the covers here. Uh, but let's talk more about what it is. It's just a different service tier of Azure SQL. Looks and acts just like Azure SQL when you connect to it. Kind of the same thing. You're not going to know, oh, I've gone into hyperscale. Unless maybe you go look at, at the size of some things. And it's backed by what they call their hy hyperscale scale out storage tech. Um, targeted to optimize for very large workloads. And you see the cap here is 100. So we've blown right through four. We've gotten to 100. And if you're a customer, if you're sitting there and you're like, well, this all sounds cool. And yeah, I, I have a migration project set for 2021. That's why I came to see Matt's session. But I know Azure SQL database is capped at four terabytes. I'm not sure what to do because I have 20. Hyperscale is where you need to be. There's a lot of resiliency provided at the storage level. And this is as, probably as deep in the kind of the, the HA architecture of this as I'm going to go. As you if you go into some of the deep dives about how hyperscale is put together, you'll see that the compute storage are different. For true high availability, you're going to need to provision at least two compute nodes. You'll get one out of the box, but again, if it fails, then um, then it fails. There's nowhere for it to fail over to. If you provision two, then that failover is going to happen for you. So let's get a few more details about this. Like I said, it's support for up to 100. I wanted to underscore that because I think it's really cool. And for some customers, downright mandatory. Um, nearly instantaneous database backups, and that's because it's it's doing snapshots, it's storing those in Azure Blob Storage. Um, I, I do have an architecture slide of the storage here in a couple slides. What this means is there's no I.O. impact. So let's say you're running a query that's very intensive and the backup starts. You won't know. And that's a real plus. Uh, the restores work the same way. So again, restores are pretty quick. It, you've probably seen, if you've attended any of, of the Microsoft sessions about hyperscale at uh, past summit, SQL bits, DPS, things like that over the last year or two, you've seen the restores where they'll restore a 10 or 20 terabyte database in seconds. Um, it's really, really cool. And like I said, just kind of opens the doors for us in terms of management. If you're dealing with very large databases, there's a lot of stuff you're having to do on-prem now that you won't have to do with this. Uh, you do get higher overall performance. So if you've read, I know there was a popular post by Brent Ozar this year. Uh, there's been some other comments there where there are kind of transaction log throughput, not caps, but... Um, kind of a ceiling that you bump against with some of the lower service tiers of Azure SQL. Uh, Hyperscale doesn't have those for all the reasons we just talked about. When we take a brief look at the storage, I, I think you'll understand why. Um, rapid scale out. So let's say you need to provision a bunch of read-only nodes. The way the storage is architected, it's fairly easy to spin that up and set that up as kind of a hot standby or to offload your reads. Um, and again, that's going to have minimal impact to your primary workload. So, you know, one of the advantages of going to the cloud, especially for a database that's really, really large, is flexibility and things like that. If it starts to get hit, hyperscale really offers that for us and rapid scale up as well. 
So you've heard me say, I think this is really cool. I'm excited about the future of it and how I think it's going to impact the other service tiers. There are some downside limits. So elastic pools are not supported. So if that sounded interesting to you, where we talked about how on the other service tiers of Azure SQL database, you can have elastic pools and put a group of databases together and kind of resource constrain them as one group, almost like an availability group. Hyperscale does not support that right now. Uh, compute and storage is built separately. I don't know if that's a downside or not, but depending on your manager or your billing people and how carefully they read the Azure statement, it could be a, da a downside because it can be confusing uh, for them to put like a line item cost on the database itself. But what does it look like? I've been teasing that for a couple slides here. So let's check this out. Here's what it looks like. Um, you probably don't want me to dive into every bit of this, but you'll notice where if you go and look at the Microsoft Docs and you want to know the architecture of Azure SQL Database on, under the covers, most of the other service tiers will say there's an MDF, there's an LDF, and it's in blob storage, or it's in this, and there may be a cluster and always on AG components on some of the service tiers, not on others. Um, this is different. So you're, you're going to see some stuff we're familiar with here. But you see, we've got the notion of page servers. We've got this log service. So we, that's not just an LDF, right? We've got a service. We've got a landing zone for data coming from the primary read-write node. That's on Azure premium storage. You've got then the long-term log storage for point-in-time restores. It's on standard to help moderate the costs there. You know, and then we go back, so we, you know, we've gone, and you can see me trace this, but you can't uh, because I'm doing it where you can't see it. But if you follow that read-write green arrow from the person on top, you'll see we've executed some stuff on the primary. We've gone over to our log service with that. We've landed everything where that needs to be. It's passed through the landing zone, or kind of our traffic has, goes to the log service, log cache, which is a local SSD. And then it makes its way to the page servers. And there's another cache there with a resilient buffer pool extension. And then the data files we finally reached with those orange arrows that are vertical towards the bottom. Then the snapshots live on that Azure standard storage as well. So it's a non-standard SQL server setup for sure. But we see some regions and some terms that we're familiar with. So, And what's most important to us is it looks like SQL server. We don't have to worry about any of this. I just think it's cool. So I wanted to share it with you. Um, another kind of interesting service tier that I wanted to throw out here, Azure SQL Database Serverless. So if you have a very bursty workload where let's say you're a retail outlet and maybe every once a month you have a big sale or once a week you have a big sale and your usage goes from you know, 10 users to 1,000. They're all signing on, buying whatever it is you're selling serverless is where you'd want to be. It is made for bursty workloads. Uh, I'm not doing the architecture justice by how I'm explaining this, but what it is designed to do is you're, you're more or less pulling like warmed up VMs out of a pool and then it kind of scales those out. I have completely undersold how the technology works, but I think for us to probably best and most quickly understand it, that's where we're at. So you may go from having, and like I said, it's not actually serverless. There are there are servers here. Um, but you may go from maybe you've got a couple boxes that are supporting your workload. User work ramps up. Now you need 10. It's going to pull all those in. It's going to take some time to do that. So it's usually about 60 seconds for a response. Um, and so, you, you know, their performance is going to, uh, not be optimal there for a bit, but it's going to get you there really fast, faster than you could respond in person. If you're sitting right there watching it, you're not going to spin up eight boxes in 60 seconds. Usage is billed by the second. And there are some configuration settings we have here that no other service tier has. So you can set the minimum number of V cores. So again, this goes by V core, not DTU. And what that means is when your workload is settled down and everything's quiet, how low can you get? You know, two cores, four cores, eight. What's enough to sustain your basic workload? And then a max. And this is really cost management too. Performance, sure, but definitely cost. You know, do you need to go all the way up to 80 cores? Probably not, but you might. 
So set those limits there. And you also set an auto pause delay as well as when everything's gone quiet, you know, how long before a lot of the machines that were pulled into the workload are basically handed back off and auto paused. So serverless is interesting, not right for everybody, but workloads that are very difficult to manage, uh, serverless can be right versus provisioning a really expensive, like high service tier Azure SQL or a really robust VM here may actually save you a good bit of money and still give you the performance you need. Um, and like I said, that's why I keep coming back to the platform as a service offerings because their combination of scaling and cost management, really, really powerful. Managed instance. So we talked about it briefly, teased it a bit. Uh, let's talk about it a little more here. It's another platform as a service offering. You get your automatic patching, you get your version updates, automated backups, high, high availability built in. Um, it is there, but there are some differing, you still have some design decisions to make. It's not all HA magic, but some of it's there. Uh, it's nearly 100% the same as an on-premises enterprise edition server. So if you're running a lot of enterprise, uh, and need those features and things like that, Managed Instance may be where you want to go. Uh, the migration path is interesting. So Data Migration Service, which we'll see briefly at the end, is possibly the best way to get to it. Um, if you have a very large database, you can do, and they've changed the name off and on through the years, it was Azure Data Box, Azure Box, I think it's back to Data Box now. But if, if you have like a 40 terabyte database, then you can contact, Microsoft, they'll send you a bunch of storage, you load the data, you send it to them, and they'll load it. Um, otherwise, the data migration service is how you get the data up there. It's, it's certainly the way that I would recommend it. it, it it's pretty good. Um, if, you, <laughs> if you used it maybe a year or two ago, it wasn't as good. Uh, it's come a long way now, and I, it's, a, it's a perfectly fine way to get to manage instance if that's where you want to go. But if you don't need that enterprise edition functionality, and you don't really care that um, you know, you don't need that comfort level of, well, now I'm connecting to an instance and I know what instances are, where this Azure SQL stuff, logical servers, I don't understand that. Um, if MI is where you end up, that's fine. They can be a good bit more expensive. So bear that in mind that like, like one of the early slides said that comfort level is important for your team, but make sure it's not costing you a bunch of money. Connecting to these is also a little different. So once you're there, it looks just like you're used to. You're connected into an instance, there's databases, there's logins, there's all the stuff you know and love. Um, but the, so the three main ways to connect, these are not just, and hopefully you don't have a SQL server with an open port on, on the internet. If you do, manage instances, not that. So three main ways. There's a secure public endpoint that you can set up. There uh, is express route and uh, or VPN, so Express Route is going to be the Azure VPN flavor, but you know any sort of kind of site-to-site -site thing uh, would allow you to, once the network security rules are set up, and again, this might be where you want an Azure networking person involved, um, as long as that VNet has access to the VNet that the managed instance is on, um, you'll be able to connect that way. Or a jump box. We RDP into a box, and it's on the same VNet as the managed instance and you just connect from management studio there and that that would be kind of the most traditional but your networking and security folks may not endorse that route so be mindful of that but yeah if you need those enterprise edition features and are willing to pay for managed instance is the platform as a service way to get those so how are we migrating databases so let's get into some methods and tooling as we start to come to a close here migration methods here's some highlights so before we get into the demos where we talk, where we show the tools, um, I get a lot of questions. You know, this this is a new session, so I'm really eager for your feedback on this. But I've gotten a lot of questions in other kind of Azure SQL flavored sessions I've done, like, well, I want to migrate, but I don't want to use any of the new tools. I just want to use stuff that that I know. This slide is is for you if that's where you're at. So the tools I'm going to show after this, we talked about DMS and some of that. Maybe I don't want to mess with that. Um, I want to use the SQL Server stuff that I know to get data up into the cloud and up onto these platforms. So migration methods, um, replication to Azure SQL. 
perfectly fine way to migrate data to an Azure SQL database. Uh, given the time, I don't have a demo for that. Um, I actually demoed that in a different session at Pass Summit three years ago. It really hasn't changed. So if you want to know how to do that, like I said, it doesn't fit into this <clears throat> and kind of some of the new tools and stuff we have that we didn't have. Um, feel free to reach out and I can send you screenshots and probably direct you to a video of that demo as well. But if you like replication and trust it, transactional, transactional replication, perfectly fine way to get up into Azure SQL database or onto a VM as well, like the second point shows. Um, it's okay to stick with the stuff you know and love. Now that migration performance is probably not going to be impressive, but it's going to work. And if it's comfortable for you and, and you have the time allowed for it to kind of do it in that old school way, it's perfectly fine. Um, log shipping to SQL Server on Azure VM. That's one way to get the data up into Azure as well. Then your options are kind of open. Uh, but if you're just looking at migrating data and maybe you've got to go to like a quick cutover or something, then, you know, if VM is the choice you make, unfortunately you can't log ship to Azure SQL database or managed instance, though I remain hopeful that that would come at some point. Um, it is perfectly adequate option if you're like, well, we need to run VMs. This past stuff sounds great, but it's not for us. A couple other options. So if it, when you're in Management Studio, if you right click on a database, and you go to tasks, you see all those different choices, right? One of them is export data to your application where you're basically making a DAC pack. They've made some advances in Management Studio where you can save that DAC pack to Azure Blob Storage and then use that to basically import your data and your database into Azure SQL. Um, it's not my favorite way to do it, but it certainly is a way. And if you're if you know your way around DAC packs and are comfortable working with those and uh, and know Azure Blob Storage, that's a perfectly fine way to do it. Last but not least is my least favorite way. So you can use bulk load like bulk insert syntax uh, to load data to a managed instance. That's a lot of ugly T-SQL. And given that we have so many nice kind of GUI ways to do it here, um, you know, I I think I would stay away from that. But I do want to mention that if you're very comfortable and know your way around a bulk insert and all that, perfectly fine. So I'm going to show you just a, a few quick things here on, on tools uh, here in about our last five or 10 minutes. And the first thing I want to show you is the data migration assistant. And I'm going to show you the GUI way to do it. It doesn't make for a very good demo, but Microsoft does give us the, the ability to run this from the command line via PowerShell so we can run it at scale. So like I've analyzed one database on one server. I'm going to show you what that looks like. Maybe we want to do 600. I'm not going to go through the interface to do all 600, right? But there is a PowerShell way to do it that then feeds into some nice but fairly basic uh, Power BI reports and things like that. And on, on my resources slide is a link to just that. So if that fits where you're at, like I said, it makes for a boring demo, um, but that that is out there. And actually their, their doc on it is very helpful. I followed it before and it, and it works pretty well. So let's have a look at the data migration assistant. Okay, so what we've got here is uh, basically what I did is, this is like a TV cooking show. I've kind of pre-baked this. So I made an assessment. You can also make a migration here as well. It depends on, you know, if you're just assessing, that's one thing. If you wanna make this a migration project from here and upload it to a DMS and all that, you can do that. Generally, most people starting out early in migration type things are doing it this way. So I chose an assessment gave it a project name, said, I'm assessing the database engine. You can do it for SSIS here as well. Source server type is SQL Server. You'll note they allow you to look at AWS RDS as well, because they want you off that and on onto Azure. And then your target server type is here. So everything we just talked about is there. Azure SQL, Azure SQL database, managed instance, VMs. But I went ahead and kind of pre-baked this because I knew we were going to be short on time. And this is one I ran against AdventureWorks 2012. And so what we've got here, feature parity is number one. And so you'll see it'll helpfully say here, like, hey, when this instance starts up, 
you're using trace flags. Azure SQL Database doesn't support trace flags. And it's going to call that out to you. And there's always going to be a recommendation of some type, whether it's code fix, whether you've used a deprecated data type, all that. You're going to have details of what it found. Well, in this stored procedure, I found this bit of code that's not supported, or I found a cross database query or something like that. Otherwise, you're going to get fairly boring call outs here, like this database uses TDE. And so it points out that Azure SQL Database doesn't exactly play nice with that, but there are recommendations and workarounds here that it provides. So that's feature parity. So if you're using deprecated features, things like that, it's going to call that out there. Compatibility issues, it's going to go by level. So maybe you know, like, well, I'm going to Azure SQL, but I need to leave it on compatibility level 120 to support this app or something. You're going to get now... AdventureWorks 2012 happens to be the same thing everywhere, but usually you don't see this. The only thing that's called out here is that full text search has changed since SQL Server 2008. It sees these full text indexes here, and it says, usually down here, you'll get a recommended fix. They'll say, like, write it this way or use this. Um, but as it notes, if there are breaking changes, it's going to be upfront about that with you. And it's going to say, um, yeah, look, you know, this breaks and you're not able to use it. But basically, that's what you'll get. And when you create a project, if I had walked beyond kind of where I showed you from the plus sign here, you're going to connect to a server, you're going to select the databases to analyze, and you're going to go from there. And then from here, you would save it. And if you want to use DMS or you already have an Azure Migrate project in flight, you can then upload that assessment to Azure Migrate. It's going to automate some of that stuff for you. Um, I don't usually do that, but it is certainly an option. So let's let's hit uh, head back to our slides just for just a minute here. All right, so we've analyzed a database. We looked at feature parity. We looked at compatibility issues. Let's look at deploying to Azure via SQL Server Management Studio. So we'll go back to our VM here, and I want to show you what I did to get to this window. So this is a VM I have out in Azure, and I right-clicked on this. I go to Tasks. So we talked about the Extract Data to Your Application Export and that on the last slide, that that's a way we can do this, and certainly valid. But they've kind of made this newer, cool way to do it. So if I click right here, Deploy Database to Microsoft Azure SQL Database, what you're going to get is a window that looks like this. And like I said, TV, food show, I've kind of pre-baked this for you, but I've connected to my Azure SQL database logical server. And that when you do that, it's just connect and then, you know, however you would do that. And it's going to default to the on-prem name. It's going to say, oh, you probably want to call it that here. And then it's going to ask for the settings for your Azure SQL database. Now, I went basic tier just because this is something I was playing around with for this session. But you'll see all the tiers we talked about. Um, you'll also see the max size. That's going to be governed based on service tier, obviously, and service objective as well. And so some of this, you know, you can see where that could change. And yeah, we've got a lot of options uh, with some of the other tiers. You've got options with hardware where, you know, with basic, it's basic, as, as the name says. Now, what happens after I click next here for AdventureWorks 2016, which is about half a terabyte on mine, uh, it takes 20 to 25 minutes and it migrates everything, all the indexes, all the data, user, all that sort of stuff. And that's it. That's all you go from here. Obviously, given the time, that's a lousy demo. And so I'm not going to make you sit here for 20 minutes and watch green check marks line line the screen. Uh, but it does work and it does work that easily. Uh, it, you know, and it's... That's much more automatic than some of the stuff used used to be. So yeah, let's go we'll go here. All right, so we've shown how to migrate a database, and it really is that simple. And so if your boss has come to you and said, if you have a database up in Azure, then you're done and you get a raise or a bonus or whatever. That's it. Um, doing that at scale, that probably wouldn't make a lot of sense, right? So. DMS, we've talked about this, and I'm going to walk you through kind of three basic things here. Uh, provisioning, I've already done that, but I'm going to show you how to create a schema only and an offline data migration as well. So what we've got here uh, is I've, oh, my apologies. Actually, we'll need to bail out of this. And yeah, so we'll go here. 
And so this is one thing I've noticed. Um, so yeah, let's, there seems to be, and I was using this heavily on a project earlier this year. So there seems to be a bit of like a portal refresh bug where if you, so I pulled this up at the start of the session, we're an hour in, and then you'll get this message that it's not available for migration at, at this time. If you go back and you reselect it from the portal, then we're fine here and, and we're healthy. So that, that strikes me as a bit strange. Don't let that alarm you. Obviously you can start and stop the service right here. Uh, so I'm going to go to new migration project and we're going to do that. And we're going to call this like DPS demo test. And I'm going to do a schema only first. And so one thing you have to do if you're using DMS to migrate this, and this can be good for databases that are very large. Like I said, if you're going to manage instance, you're moving a few terabytes. This is how you're going to want to do it. You go to schema only. And we're going to click save. So we've added that and we're going to do a create and run activity here. All right. So we're going to need our source SQL server. And so we're going to go to our overview. And so that's our IP. Uh, authentication type is going to be SQL because I haven't federated any of my authentication. Like I said, it's good for us to involve networking people to do that sort of thing. So in theory, I've connected to my server, if everything's going to play nice here. And I should get a list of databases here before too long. It's a great time to take a drink of water. And the login here has failed. So hopefully, I know this, <laughs> this all worked perfectly last night. So I will type this extra carefully and hopefully we'll have success here. Otherwise, I'm just going to have to vividly describe to you what happens after this. Um, and basically what it does is, yeah, so it, what it does from here is you're going to get a list of databases. And in fact, let's, uh, let's go to the VM. Let's just double check here. Aha. Okay. So actually, this is the wrong user. So I wanted to give the feeling of a, of a live session here. And, and I think probably I've done that by having one of the demos act up. Um, okay. So back to it here. All right. So now, so we've specified our source. Now we're going to go to our target and we're going to copy that name to the clipboard here. And we're going to do that. And then I'm going to use the right user here. Uh, and just as a word of advice, it's usually a good idea to kind of have this stuff, not necessarily written down, but recorded somewhere. So you can kind of quickly step through this. Um, and I actually have that, but I, I misread which server I was on. <laughs> All right. And so what we've got here, let's say we're going to move AdventureWorks 2019. And so, all right. So what's interesting here is I actually have to create a database it won't automatically do this. So we're going to go back to target. I don't want to do any of that. So then let's go to our DPS migration. So you can see I, I cleaned all this up after I ran the test. And so we're going to go, let's see, SQL databases. That's all right. We're going to go here and I'm going to create a database and I'm going to call it AdventureWorks 2019. You'll see it kind of preloads all this. Adventure Works 2019, not 2018, 2019. I don't want to use an elastic pool. Here you'll see all these server tiers we talked about, hyperscale serverless all here. When you go to configure database and you're provisioning one, you get access to all those. Um, I'm just going to go with basic here and I'm going to review and create. And this should take just, just a few seconds. And then when it's done, we're going to be able to walk through the rest of our migration. And so while we're waiting on that, let's, um, let's go back to the slides and let's talk about what we've learned here. So what have we learned? We didn't talk licensing, but you need to understand how licensing is handled in your organization because that, 
like I mentioned up top, the only licensing chat I really had, Azure Hybrid benefit is a real financial incentive to choose Azure. Um, heavy, heavy discounts on SQL Server licenses if you're moving them from on-prem to Azure. So understand your licensing footprint now. Uh, understand how that's going to change with this. And under that's where the cost savings, where you really begin to understand that, you know, is consolidating a bunch of stuff on a VM better? Is using a bunch of platform as a service better? We'll see. Um, ensuring that DBAs, developers, applications, whatever, know the proper connection methods for migrated databases, like I said, you know, for authentication, Azure SQL is a little different than we may be used to. We don't have Windows Auth there. We might have federated Azure Active Directory, which is going to be different. For managed instances, we're not connecting to just support in an instance. It's a little bit more than that. Maybe an endpoint, maybe something else. Our maintenance procedures are going to change based on what we've chosen here. You know, on a VM, we're going to do all the same maintenance we have been. If we landed on a platform as a service offering, we're not going to do that. Um, it's going to take care of a lot of that for us, but there's still some things we should do with query tuning and things like that. Lift and shift isn't always the right choice. Knowing the motivation for the, for the migration itself is that's how we make the correct decision on where this stuff lands. We, why are we doing it? Is it money saving? Is it to get a bonus? Is it because my boss told me any of those things? And going back to the title of the session, we talked about moving mountains. And when I put that in there, I kind of like the sound of it, but also those organizational obstacles can really seem like mountains. You know, you can have somebody in charge of something that says, you're not doing this even though you're supposed to. And so knowing your way around the organization, knowing who to ask, all those sorts of things can be really important to getting those mountains out of the way. So let's, uh, let's flip back to our, just for a second. Okay, so we've got that. And so we're going to go through here and what I'm going to do. So the schema only in the offline data migration look very similar. Um, and what schema only does so you see now that we have a target database, it's going to auto match that schema source. We want to generate it from the source. So what this is going to do from here is we'll go here. We're going to start migration. It's also always going to want us to give it a name. So we'll just go schema only migration. And in the interest of time, we'll kind of talk through this next part and show you the resources slide and head on to our next session. So you see, you get here. I'm impatient. So I like to auto research this. And the migration details column is what you want to watch here. And it's going to go to generating scripts. This takes three to four minutes uh, for the AdventureWorks 2019 schema. So then what you've got here, when it comes right down to it, is we've got um, we'll have the full schema out there. And the way DMS works is you migrate the schema first because online data migration, there's a ton of moving parts you have to do. I don't recommend that. I, it can work, but it's very complicated. And for people like us who are probably new to this in this session, I don't recommend that. So I do schema only. And so you step one, create the database, then step two, do a schema only migration within DPS. Then step three, you do an offline data migration where it's going to port all that stuff over. And then your database is moved. Uh, one caveat to DMS and using it is there's a number of ports you have to have open, including some non-standard ones like port 445. So if DMS, if you want to use managed instance, let's say, or Azure SQL, uh, and DMS is your choice, please talk to your Azure networking people. Um, please, please get them involved because they're going to have to open some ports for you. And odds are you don't have the ability to do that yourself. Here is the resources slide. Thank you so much to Microsoft for continuing to support uh, all the Microsoft data platform organizations around the world. Thank you so much to Data Platform Geeks for having me. It means a lot to be at the summit. It was so meaningful to be there last year, and I, I hope we're all back in person soon. Don't forget, go win some prizes. Here's some ways to do that. Take selfies, all that. Here are ways to find me, uh, Matt at SQL at Speed, SQL at Speed everywhere online, blog is SQL at Speed as well, and there will be some migration theme content there over the winter, so looking forward to sharing that with you as well. Thank you so much for having me, and enjoy the rest of the conference.